Hi, I'm Harold Bell, and I am your host for Speak the Truth. First, I would like to introduce you to the team of Speak the Truth. Gary Johnson is the CEO, publisher, and founder of BlackMenInAmerica.com. He is today's facilitator. Black Men in America's website is ranked number five out of 500 Black websites on the internet. Our political analyst and commentator is Christopher C.J. Johnson. Rounding out the team are a veteran pioneer television broadcaster, producer, actress, and former Sirius XM talk radio show host, Ms. Maggie Linton. Jackie Jones is a veteran newswoman who has written for the Washington Post, the New York Newsday, in the Baltimore Sun. She was once a producer for my sports talk show, Inside Sports. Presently, she is the Assistant Dean for Programs and Chair of the Department of Multimedia Journalism at Morgan State University. Joining us is a new face in the house on Speak the Truth, Dr. Julia Giat Diagandi is a native Washingtonian and a graduate of Howard University. Dr. Diagandi, is an independent contractor, grants coordinator, and facilitator. She is a social justice innovator who mainstreams empowerment perspectives and strengths based on approaches for community engagement efforts and organizational changes. Dr. Diagandi is a true believer in the transformation power of children and youth. She's following in the footsteps of her father, who I know as a legendary community activist, Lawrence Gear. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome everybody to speak the truth. And we're going to start off with the trailer, then I will come back. And uh, oh, yeah, my man is here. <laughs> Dwayne Bryan is here. Dwayne uh, is an author. <laughs> is an author. Uh, I've, I've got a great book out called The Stop. I mean, he has been around the country speaking to young people, telling them how to survive or stop. And he has been a regular man here on Speak the Truth. Now, let's go to the trailer, and then I'll come back and introduce our special guest. All right. Let's see if we can get this bad boy started. Here we go. I'm looking at him, and he's scared. He's scared of me. I see kids, when they see me in uniform, go out their way to say to the top of their lungs, I hate the police. Can't stand the police. They used to move us. What happened? I heard a bullhorn and it said, pull over. The first thing out of their mouth was, What are you doing here? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Looks like the profiling is so dangerous because people can't Quite a bit of what we worry about today when we talk about bias is due to perception. We do have to think about the Americans as being stronger, more violent. So the enemy in any family can encourage them to stand. I walk the streets of my own neighborhood. I'm chased and hounded, persecuted, and guns drawn on me. You know, men and women feeling the need to kill somebody because they frighten them is outrageous. You don't get to just shoot them in the back. We asked kids what is some of the sounds of spring, and they said gunfire. I mean, there's a lot of pain going on out there. People are not taking it off themselves. The problem is most have learned to coexist with that trauma and do it for I think that so many people in minority communities have to do it. And we're so good guys. We're supposed to be the ones that make you not fear. Right now, the fire is within the African American community. I said, there's a problem here. This is a battle for our identity. Change is going to come from within. We've got to start seeing each other as a value and as an asset. Love covers a multitude of things. Love is the answer. It's a possibility now for healing to actually occur. The relief comes from relationship. I have to love you and value your life enough to make a difference. It's about being able to put in the work even when you don't want to. Absent love, we have chaos. Absent love, we have nothing. Who are we going to become as a society? The next doctor that would cure cancer could have their life cut short. All right, all right, all right. Let me introduce my special guest. Uh, A.J. Ali is a native Washingtonian, now living in Henderson, Nevada. 
He is a service disabled United States Air Force veteran, recently retired from film, television, and music production. AJ is passionately pursuing his purpose to dismantle systemic racism, improve police community relations. He has traveled the country trying to help people learn how to love uh, each other. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. AJ Ali. How you doing, AJ? Hey, I'm good. Harold, aloha, everybody. All right. Okay. Tell us about uh, that. what is all about love. Tell us what that is all about. Well, uh, love is the answer. Love is an acronym. And uh, we, we turn that into a pledge. And I'll I'll just give you that pledge because it's the, it's the heart, the core of our teachings, everything that we're doing around the country. I, uh, people are taking this pledge, police and, and others in the community, and it's spreading. I pledge to learn about the people in my community, to unconditionally open my heart to their needs as if they were all immediate family members, to volunteer to be part of the solution in their life during both good and challenging times, and to empower everyone I meet to do the same as if our lives depended on each other. That's fantastic, man. Uh, is, it is uh, great to have you aboard because uh, this is uh, a format uh, and a philosophy that many of us are, are, are trying to go in that direction, trying to find a way how to come up with solutions. And yeah. uh, I, what I like to do is, uh, Go first to uh, our friend uh, Dwayne Bryant, who has a, a book called The Stop. He's trying to do the same thing in, across the country. He's based out of Chicago. Dwayne, how about coming here and meeting um, our man, AJ Ali? And you call me. I was trying to get that lunch on. I've been eating all day. <laughs> I was trying to chew, floss, swiggle. Hey, first of all, I love the trailer. Love the work that Brother Ali is doing. I love his approach as well. Um, I think that he clearly has a, a, a level of patience and tolerance that I don't have. And I think that it's necessary and it's absolutely needed. I think that when one side is loving and kind, and the other side is brutalizing and murdering, it makes my tolerance for loving you and loving the person who's willingly, willfully uh, inflicting this punishment on my people, it makes my love for them, it, it's literally getting less and less. And being here in Florida, seeing the Trump signs, the Trump flags, it's even getting less and less. And that's probably the absolute opposite of what Brother Ali is, is trying to steer us to. So I'm hoping he can help this brother here have more love by the end of this conversation because I don't know if I'm loving my enemies like that. All right, all right. Uh, Gary Johnson. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, AJ, I think you and I may have met going back all the way to maybe 2014. You've been grinding, man. Was there one thing that really got you to the point of saying, enough is enough, I gotta use my platform and my skills to help educate and bring people along. Yeah, Gary, well, it was that day in uh, Howard County, Maryland in June of 2012 when I thought I was gonna be another statistic. Um, that was the day that uh, this journey started in earnest for me to uh, try to change things and not just talk about it with my friends, you know, and make jokes about it uh, rather than cry about it after yet another racial profiling stop. I had been, you know, I'm, I'm 50, 57 years old and uh, I was 48 at the time that this particular stop happened. And up until that time, I had been stopped probably a dozen times for driving while black. You know, I've been followed in stores a hundred times, you know, just like all of us have probably experienced. But it was that day when a 26 year old white cop drove by me twice and then drove up a third time and stopped, got out of his car and asked me, what are you doing here? And I was going for a walk in my own community, brother. Mm -hmm. And it went downhill from there because it, it wasn't too long after that that he started accusing me of breaking into homes and threatening me with uh, search and seizure and arrest. And uh, when I schooled him on the, on the constitution and asked him, did he, did he really believe he was within his rights to say the things that he's saying? 
And he got so flustered that he turned around and walked back to his own car and refused to get out. Um, you know, I, I thought it was over at that point, and I said, and I went, went over to the car and I said, officer, if we're done here, I'm going to continue my walk. And he didn't answer me. So I said it like 10 times because I wanted to make sure I didn't get shot in the back when, yeah. I, when I turned to walk away. And so finally, I knew he heard me, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't respond. He just kept looking straight, straight ahead. So I, I, started, I started walking and I made a little videotape uh, as I left. And then I called my attorney. And I called my attorney because I had experienced something similar while driving just a few months earlier. And I was really upset. And I, I called him and he said, man, just get out of there. You, you just get out of there and, and be safe. And no sooner did I do that than, than the first officer and two other cops rolled up. They got out of their car. They pretty much ran over to me nose to nose. One had his hand on his taser. Another was in a football stance ready to take me down. And I said, my attorney's on speakerphone. He hears everything. And they took a step back. That was the moment that I thought it was going to be it for me. I was going to wind up being another black man on the news with some lawyer standing next to my wife trying to console her. And the, the fact that I had my attorney on the phone, the fact that I had the privilege of being able to have attorney pick up mm -hmm. and be there for me, you know, that and, and the grace of God saved me that day because I know those guys had bad intentions. And I thought that was going to be the end of it. When I, when I was able to get out of there and when I reported it to Internal Affairs and NAACP and Human Rights Commission, I thought that was gonna be the end. I thought I was gonna get some resolution, but I didn't, no apology, no, we did something wrong, no, nothing. What happened was that I became a target for harassment by the Howard County Police Department for the next year. And so word got out and I was followed. I was stopped several times. My wife was followed, she was stopped, she was harassed. And there were many times, Brother Dwayne, there were many times during that period when I, I, I didn't have that love in my heart. You know, when I, when I thought this is going to be the day that I take somebody out before they take me. And again, by the grace of God, I, I made the right decisions to, to, to not go down that path and gut it out. That was the moment that, um, you know, that, that, that I knew that I need to do something. I need to do something. I, need to, I needed to stop this from happening as much as I possibly could. And I started to work on the film. And um, it took, took uh, quite a while to get the film done, but it came out in 2017. And between 2012 and 2017, I received death threats. I, I was harassed many, many times from people all over the country. Mm -hmm. you know, how dare you try to come out and say that we're doing something wrong? This was before you know, all the, all the major things that were, that were coming out. I felt like a one man band at times, you know, but we got this film done and something happened to me along that journey. I had a lot of hate in my heart, a lot of fear. I had stopped doing the things I love to do. I even stopped going for walks. Mm -hmm. um, but it was God that spoke to me on the beach in Hawaii in 2014 on my, on my birthday. And I was trying to get this film done and no doors would open. And I just wanted to get people fired. You know, I just wanted to get, get, get these guys and everyone like them out of a job. But I felt the Holy Spirit speak to my heart on that beach. And the Holy Spirit said to my heart, if you want to do something, if you want to really make a difference, then you got to do this with love. You got to put everything else aside and trust me because love is the most powerful force in the universe. Remember the last words of your brother, Abby, who died in 1998, who lived his whole life in Washington, DC. His last words on his deathbed to me were, love is the answer. Hmm. Here's a man who battled cancer for 13 years, a man who had been in prison several times, a man who lived the two lives, really. The first half was as a, you know, he, 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 was, he was a good man to us, but he also was a drug dealer and, you know, he did other things and he wound up in, in, in prison. But he was always good to us. I would have followed him anywhere. He, he kept me out of all that stuff. Second half of his life was glorious. He, 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 he had a successful painting business. He, he dedicated his life to the Lord. He loved everybody he met. He had so many people at 19th Street Baptist Church when he passed away, it was overflowing. <laughs> People come up, tell me stories I'll never forget about how he helped them. 
every single time I was with him, he would go and help a family in need. He'd bring a little toy truck to a kid or give some money to a single mom or, you know, whatever. He always did something to make a difference in somebody's life every day. So when, when he said, and, and by the way, he's also the one who saved my, my second marriage. My first marriage blew up, you know, because I was an, I was an idiot. And in and, and the second marriage, I was about to do the same thing to it with, with my, my lovely wife, Jane, of 26 years now. But in 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 year five, six and seven, it was touch and go. He was the one who pulled me aside and said, stop looking at all the things she's doing wrong and look at yourself. Because no matter how many women that you're with, one marriage, two marriage, three marriage, four marriage, you're going to be the constant. You're going to be the same guy. You need to you need to look at yourself, brother. Love is the answer. So when he said love is the answer on his deathbed, his last words on earth to me, then I knew I needed to take it to heart. So that's when, when the Holy Spirit reminded me of that on that beach. I call it my second baptism. I knew I needed to take it to heart. So I made a promise to God right then and there that no matter what they do to me, no matter what they try to do to others, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight this with the most powerful force in the universe, with love. And a lot of people thought I was crazy. But enough people stuck by me that we got this film made, and it's been making a difference around the country in small pockets ever since every single person that sees this film goes away changed. And now every single person that, that, that reads our book, our Love is the Answer book that Nat has in his background, reads that book and has changed. And I'm talking about six foot five white cops who hated the community that they served, coming up to me with tears in their eyes. I mean, streaming down their face, saying, Mr. Ali, I'm gonna change the way I do business as of right now because of this film. I've had cops come to me and talk about how the book, which goes deep into the community and police marriage, come up to me and say how the book has helped to save their marriage because of all the things that they were putting their, their spouse through because of the stresses of the job. I can't stress it enough. This love thing that I'm talking about, it's not this soft, touchy feely kind of love. It's a, what kind of love do you have for your brother if your brother is addicted to drugs and stealing from you, you know, or if you're, or if your, your, your sister is, is doing things that she shouldn't do, do you discard them? No, nah, you, you, it might be tough love, right? But you're going to love them and you're going to find every way possible to help them. So that's, that's the kind of love I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about being an apologist and letting them get away with anything. I come at them hard when they're wrong, but I also come at them hard with, with, with the kind of love that, I would give to my my brother Abby. So, man, what you just said just proves that one person can make a difference. And when we look back, and when I post this, and I listen to this again, and again, and again, <laughs> I'm gonna get something out of it. I appreciate that. Amen. Jackie, Jackie Jones. Yes. I got a couple of quick questions, well, not quick questions, but a couple of questions. One is, where have you seen the greatest success or impact uh, from uh, folks who have taken the pledge and, and what changes have, have they brought? And my other question is, who are the hardest people to convince to get mm. with the program? Mm. Well, there's a couple places, there's, there's pockets all over the country where we've seen really great success, including in Howard County where it all started. Congressman Elijah Cummings, love that man, miss him so much. He was, he was, he was the greatest fan of this program. He had a screening at, at Howard High School when he found out that uh, I wasn't getting anywhere with the Howard County Police Department and getting them to adopt these principles. And uh, he had a screening at Howard High School. And there was a guy named uh, Major Luther Johnson, a member of the Howard County PD, second in command, black guy, who had pretty much given up on 
uh, he, 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 he had a love for policing, but he, had, I think he had given up on the notion that things could be better. And he, he shared some things in confidence with me that I won't share here, but what I will share is that uh, he was the voice of that department that I could relate to from the beginning, from the moment that the NAACP sat me down with him and we had a very uncomfortable talk. And he was towing the party line. He wasn't giving up any ground. He wasn't apologizing or anything, but he would listen and I would, you know, I would listen to him. And we didn't trust each other. Um, but over a few years of getting to know each other, we kind of made a little inroads with each other in terms of being able to find a little bit of common ground. You know, we both golf and things like that, right? And so he came to that screening that Congressman Cummings held at Howard High School. And he came with a caveat that he would only come if he could, if he could speak after the film. And he used these words, if he could give a rebuttal. Now he hadn't even seen the film and he wanted to give a rebuttal. And so he came with six or seven people from his department and some of them sat in the front row with their arms folded like they do when they don't wanna be somewhere, <laughs> but they have to be there. <laughs> and he came, you know, because quite frankly, Elijah Cummings issued a, a mandate to that department that the chief or somebody was gonna show up to the screening. And the chief was on vacation, so it was up to Luther Johnson to come. I think that I think the Lord moved that chief on vacation just so Luther could come. Because when that film ended and he sat up on the panel next to me on my right hand side, and I gave him his wish, you the first to speak, brother. Here's the microphone. He took that mic, he looked at me and he put his head between his knees. I thought he was gonna lose it. He lifted his head back up. He had tears in his eyes. He had tears in his eyes. Pardon me, I'm gonna, I got a little noise here in the background, okay. He had tears in his eyes and he looked at the audience of 500 people. And he said, I just spent the last week losing weight, stressed out, stomach curtain, preparing a rebuttal for a film I had not yet seen. And after seeing this film, I got to throw that rebuttal in the trash. And he took that piece of paper and he balled it up. And he said, this film just changed my life. And the next day he had me come to his office. Actually, he, he, he took me out to breakfast and then he, he took me to his office. And uh, I felt like I was going to the lion's den. <laughs> I really did. I was nervous. I didn't know what was gonna happen. But he introduced me to the, 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 the person who was heading up HR, Lisa Myers, who was almost ready to retire. And she was so nice. And he introduced me to a couple other people and, and they, 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 they treated me with respect. And he took me to the conference room where we sat and we talked. And before long, he, he just broke down. He apologized. He was, he was crying like a, like a baby. And I, I, I hope he doesn't mind me saying it, but you know, the, I think the mark of a, a good man is, is, is to be able to let your feelings show, you know, and, and be authentic and be transparent. And um, he pledged to me that day, along with that apology, that he was going to do everything he could to walk, with, walk this walk with me. And the Howard County Police Department, under his great urging, because the then chief didn't want to do it, became the first department in the United States to get a lifetime license to use the film to train their people. It wasn't too long after that, that the chief basically he left. I think things were getting hot in there because some people wanted things to change. And who'd they bring in? The person who had retired from HR, Chief Lisa Myers now. First black woman to, to run the Howard County Police Department. Since then, they've been, they've been working with the NAACP in ways that they never did. They did a golf tournament that raised $20,000 for, for our, our kids and, and, some, and, and some needs of uh, cops who have PTSD as well. There's some other great things happening in Howard County uh, since that time. Um, I've seen things change. And, and Nat Alston, who's on this Zoom, he, he's been a big uh, part of that. Uh, there's a DA, second story, and I'll stop with this one. 
Second story, a district attorney found out about my film in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. White guy, Republican. Um, he said, you know what? I'm going to lean in on this because my community needs this. And why did he do it? Because he has a daughter who he adopted who has darker skin than him. And he's seen firsthand the kind of hatred that has been cast towards her throughout her lifetime. And so he made a commitment, even though he was very, very uncomfortable. And he said, I'm going to bring this to Bucks County. That was in January. First showing was Martin Luther King weekend at a school. Since then, here's what's happened. Bucks County has purchased 750 of our Love is the Answer books. They've made a commitment to train all 2,400 county employees with Love is the Answer by the end of the year, and they're well on their way. There's a high school there uh, in Bucks County that committed that all seniors would have to watch the film before they graduate. It's a graduation requirement. 38 out of 40 police chiefs in Bucks County have agreed to use love-based policing and follow the Love is the Answer principles and show the film and train all their officers. 38 out of 40. This is in a rural white county where there's, there's been racism, but nobody cared. Everybody was complicit, but things are changing there. And we have things going on with them every single week. And I'm seeing hearts break wide open, minds change, lives trans transformed. There's a major movement going on. Four more district attorneys in the state of Pennsylvania have adopted our film, universal lifetime license to use the film in their county and, and bring in the book and bring us in to talk and work with them, do the hard work to make things happen. So I could go on and on, but that's two examples of some major things that are happening as a result of people just learning how to love their neighbor. We're just giving them a roadmap and we're holding their hand as they walk that journey. And we're seeing incredible things happen. And again, Chris, Matt Austin, who's on here, who's the- Okay, the, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll okay. okay. And Christopher, Christopher, I know you got something great. Young man, go ahead. Um, hi, yeah. Um, the only thing I really had was um, on your message of leading with love. How is uh, the best way you would think to sell that to maybe like millennials and Gen Z who are a little bit less um, mm. let's say have a little less faith in the police and are a little bit more frustrated right now with the calls for reform and outrage, even yeah. based on your experiences that you shared earlier of how deep the corruption can go in some of these departments. How do we, you know, replicate mm. that message of love and how do we sell it on a mass scale to get, you know, your film in front of more people to expand that reach? Yeah, CJ, that's a, that's a great question, man. I, you know, my, my daughter, Sierra is, uh, is kind of in that space, you know, right now. She has a really hard time trusting that uh, any, any law enforcement can be good people. She feels that if they were good people, they'd leave the industry and go do something else because the system is totally broken. But we know the system ain't broken. It's, it's doing exactly what it was intended to do, right? And we also, uh, I know, um, it's not apparent sometimes, but I know there's a lot of good people in law enforcement. And unfortunately, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of bad people and there's a lot of people who just are indifferent. And so when indifference comes, bad things happen, right? So what I'm telling people, including my daughter, who I, I, I love more than, you know, <laughs> you know, than life itself, right? Um, you gotta trust in this thing called love. You gotta participate in the process. You know, if we want to see the, the, the change come, then some of us have to be willing to go inside and become members of law enforcement, become lawyers, become judges, become everything that there is within that system and be the change that we want to see. When people talk about abolishing the police or completely defunding police, and when you say the word defund, of course, you know, the, 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 the arms go up and you know, and, and, and people cut off uh, because they, they, they don't, I understand what people are talking about, but the fact is we're never gonna get rid of policing. 
there, there would be total chaos without some sort of, of people there standing in the gap. If somebody's breaking into my house, I'm not calling my neighbor. I'm calling the police, you know. Um, we need to see policing change, and we need to be that change. And so I'm telling people who are feeling a certain way, maybe, you know, maybe you're right about the way you feel about this system because it wasn't designed for us. But we have the power to change that. We have the power to change that. And so we, we just need to be part of that process. And, and the three steps I'm asking people to do are simple. Watch the film and discuss it with others. Read the book and discuss it with others. And then do the work. And I'm talking about, you know, creating things like organic gardens, love is the answer gardens, where you have police and others in the community doing work in the dirt side by side growing fruits and vegetables and giving them away to, to elderly people and others in the community who maybe don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And I'm seeing lives change through things like that. In Compton, Sheriff's Department with, with kids grew 10,000 pounds of food and gave them away to people in the community that couldn't afford to buy the food or couldn't have access to it because there weren't no grocery stores in their community. That's a good thing. You know, hearts change. Um, I, I'm just I'm just asking people to trust in it, you know, and, and and it may be hard. It's hard for me, but I've seen the results. The there's no other way, really, because police aren't going anywhere, and, it, and it's really up to us as to what kind of policing do we want to reimagine. And we can't do that from the outside looking, and we can't do that by not being part of the process. We got to get involved. We got to take that risk and go into the lion's den and build some relationships and, 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 you know, be the change we want to see. Nat Austin, you out there, my man. How are you, sir? How's everyone? Hey, how you doing, my man? All right. If I can chime in a little bit, Harold, back to uh, CJ's question and, and, and dovetail also on AJ's answer. CJ um, and for the rest of the group, I probably have been with AJ now. I've known him for over 20 years, but been involved with him and love his answer movement for about the last three. And I have probably facilitated this movie. I guess, AJ, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, probably more than anyone in the last two and a half years anyway, because I was almost showing it to a location up in Ypsilanti, Michigan, almost once a month. And oddly enough, I'm uh, facilitating that again in Ypsilanti, bringing together two groups uh, this coming Wednesday. But back to your question, CJ, uh, from a law enforcement standpoint and from a millennial standpoint, uh, trust definitely is there. Example was when we showed this movie to a police chief and to the community in Ypsilanti, we had millennials your age there. And the police chief was so moved that he basically apologized for his police department, the way that they were treating the black men in Ypsilanti. That started the ball rolling in terms of trust. Hey, if you, if, and he basically said, I'm paraphrasing, if we're being perceived by you as the enemy, then I sincerely apologize that that should not happen again. And hey, um, it's a point now that we're going to do our best to start building that trust. So back to your, your question again, and the answer, as I see it, being a former law enforcement officer myself, is that we've got to build the trust. They've got to build the trust to your age group again and really be open and honest in saying that. And then it's a two-way street. Trust is not a one-way. Trust is a two-way. So we've got to do that, as I see it, one step at a time. So if we can get the police to come into the community, uh, I agree with AJ, the, particularly the younger police officers that are coming in there that represent your age group and maybe a couple of years older, they see the movie, which they have, and we have some hard discussions with them. Hey, this is a perception, and how you can change that is building that word trust again on both sides where they can see you and you can see them. And as AJ mentioned, the garden, 
we've got a group coming up there in Ypsilanti because I've been working up there quite frequently uh, that's going, uh, called Good Hope and they, pr they plant gardens. So we're looking at maybe a joint relationship because sometimes when you get your hands dirty and you're right there alongside someone that's a police officer and you start talking, what do you do? You build up a relationship. The person knows you and you know him or know her. And I could say, hey, CJ, you say, hey, Nat, how you doing? And well, all how so-and-so. You build up that rapport and that relationship. It's not gonna happen overnight. I'm not naive. It's not gonna happen overnight, but we've got to start somewhere and start rebuilding that trust. And we're saying rebuilding that trust by talking to you, building up that, the more we talk, the more we start understanding how you feel and you know how we feel, then you get that common understanding. And so I've seen it happen where, hey, we've got police officers out there now playing basketball with them. Uh, and next thing you know, they, one guy was saying, hey, I didn't know you had a good jump shot like that. And you were watching that. So, hey, the commonality starts building up that rapport. So I hope I've answered your question in a little bit. But, yeah, we, we do know that. And that's what we've got to do. Uh, piggybacking, what you see on the background, and I got your text uh, also, AJ. I'm chairman of the board of the National Association of African Americans and Human Resources. We're right in the middle. We signed a strategic partnership with AJ, Ali, and Love is the Answer. And I say we, I basically signed that strategic partnership myself. As chairman of the board and one of the founders of this organization, we're the Black Sherm. We're, we're composed of about 7,000 HR people from entry level up to senior level in 30 cities. And I was one of the 12 founders of this organization. And I'm now chairman of the board of this organization. So I have the, shall we say, the authority to sign what I see in the best interest of our organization, strategic partnerships. We signed with AJ back, I think in 2017. And we said, look, we're gonna put our organization on the line, wherever you go, we will go. And I told AJ to make it even better, wherever he goes, I will be with him. Uh, for some of you, you already know, Harold knows this. I spent 10 years in law enforcement. I'm a former Maryland State Police Officer. I'm also a former three years with Prince George's County Police. And I was chief of police at Bowie State University. So I've got a law enforcement background. I have, even have family members that are retired state police, retired metropolitan. So I've got a law enforcement background too, but I spent most of my time in the corporate sector and now I've got my own company. I say that to say this, I understand law enforcement probably better or just as well as other law enforcement officers because I've seen three different agencies. And I've also seen how those agencies work in terms of business culture. So what we've said, I, I committed to AJ, when we had our conference up in Michigan, two years ago, 2018, that we will make, and we will give back to the city of Ypsilanti and to the county of Washtenaw County. So we helped them to sign a, licensing agreement with the city of Ypsilanti, a lifetime licensing agreement where they can show that movie in the city of Ypsilanti to whomever. We took it another step further and got the county of Washtenaw County, the sheriff's department, to sign a universal licensing agreement. And so now we can show that movie and facilitate that movie. So, and, and really when I say the movie and the movement throughout the entire county, and AJ, I have to tell you also, and the group, yesterday I met with our chapter in Rochester, New York. And guys, ladies and gentlemen, AJ advised me that Monroe County in upstate New York, Rochester, if anybody knows where Rochester, New York is, they're in the county of Monroe County. Well, we have a chapter up there. And yesterday I met with that chapter's leadership, their board, it was consisting of 12 people. And I shared with them what that universal licensing agreement is and what we will do as a chapter to facilitate with, along with the police department, the showing, the book and the work 
of Love is the Answer movement. So AJ and CJ, back to your points in there. Is that when we signed on, we said, hey, this is a movement, not a moment. And wherever AJ goes in terms of getting universal lifetime licensing agreements, and we have a chapter, and this chapter is consisting of people who look like us here, that they will help facilitate and move that needle forward on those sheriff's departments. When we looked at Bucks County, Pennsylvania, that's right outside of Philadelphia. We got a Philadelphia chapter. When we go to Michigan, we've got a state of Michigan chapter. So we're engaging now our people of color who are in HR to coordinate with those police departments, those sheriff's departments, because sometimes that sheriff's department, as AJ mentioned, is a little reluctant in showing this movie out in the community. They want to basic, you know, police departments are very conservative. You know, they want to, well, let's check out the neighborhood. Let's check the ground. Yesterday, I told the board up there, I said, you're going to push that needle. With that universal licensing agreement, you can show it throughout the entire county of Monroe County. That means churches, the NAACP, any youth groups, whatever. So you, we're going to put the police department on the spot and say, look, we know now you've got a universal licensing agreement. We've got a strategic partnership with Walking Wild Black, Love is the Answer, and AJR Lee. We're going to force you now. We're going to have it at whatever Baptist church or whatever Presbyterian church or whatever community organization. And guess what? Your sheriff's deputies and sheriff hierarchy have got to be there. So that's pushing that needle forward. So that's what we said in that strategic partnership with AJ. Wherever he goes, we're gonna be with him because we're all people of color in our organization. And this is part of our social justice movement. We understand that. They were enthused about it, AJ. I talked to all 12 of them on the board. They were excited about it. And they're ready now to start co-facilitating that movie and, and the Love is the Answer movement to Monroe County. So I'm gonna stop and say this. One person, AJ, can make a difference. We've signed on with him. And we're here now with a national organization that's committed, back to your point, CJ, we've got people at our board who represent you. They're not me, they're your age generation. And they're coming in there with the same viewpoint and perspective that you have. I also have a organization, well, grandchildren and grandson. That's the same way. What are we doing to do that? So I've, I've got along with AJ to make a major difference. So when you walk in there as a black man in America, hey, you're going to have, depending on that, this movement, you're gonna have people that's gonna take a different look. So we've gotta change the culture of these police departments. There's over, I think 18,000 police departments in the country. So when you start looking at all of these, not say in Maryland, but when you start looking at these sheriff's departments, these local police departments out here that can put you in a criminal justice system, this is what we're doing. AJ doesn't know this right now, so I'm, I'm preempting it a little bit. But here again, I'm committed to making a change in the criminal justice system, not just law enforcement, but also the criminal justice system. AJ and I have been on webinars also with the state's attorneys for Howard County. The, there's also a national organization of state's attorneys. I just got off the phone yesterday with a lady who is the founder and the executive director for the Corporate Council Women of Color. She's headquartered right here, Harold, in your backyard in Fort Washington, Maryland. Her name is Lori Robinson. She is the executive director for the Corporate Council Women of Color. These are African-American and women of color who are attorneys, who are lawyers. Lawyers on the criminal justice side, lawyers on the corporate side, 
general counsels. I've said to Lori, I want you to meet our president, Erica Broadwater, and also I want her to meet AJ Ali, because these are women, but guess what? They've got sons and guess what? They're women and they can still get stopped by the police, regardless of who they are. So you look at any woman out there, there was a case out there in Florida where this, uh, the state's attorney, county attorney in Florida got stopped by the police because she had an unmarked car and tinted windows. And they gave her the riot act because they couldn't, when they checked her tag, it came back zero because she was a, a prosecuting attorney. So those incidences out there, we know that. So I'm, I know I'm rambling on a little bit, Harold, but I wanted to give everyone a global picture of what I'm doing and making sure that walking while black, love is the answer, is out there for every person that we come in contact with. So a, CJ, I just wanna let you know, your generation is not being overlooked. We've got young people out there and my charge to you and to Gary is that, hey, this is a day of collaboration. We need black men in America. We need white men in America. We need women of color in America. And I am passionate, I mean passionate about this movement moving on because from us being human resource people, what does that mean? Human resources, people, people of color. So we've even pivoted and said to many people, what we stand for now is diversity, inclusion, equity, equality, peace, and justice. That's what we stand for. And we are making that pivot and I'm unapologetic in what I say to anybody. Your generation, we need you. We need you and Gary, particularly black men in America. We need you to join us where we can come on here and move this movement forward. Because here again, change starts from the top, yes, but it also change, we've got to change these police departments as I told Harold, the unions, the FOP, and the culture. We've got to change that. AJ said in Bucks County, one of the sheriff, uh, chiefs up there saying, they involve the NAACP now in the overall recruitment and hiring and interviewing process. So if you're applying for a job, let's say one of your friends, CJ, is applying for a job, they've got a better chance now because guess what? The community is involved in the interviewing process. So that's, that's the long game that we've got to look at also. And that's what I try to educate every chance we get. How can we make this change? Not just doing lip service, not just showing the movie and that's it. That's the moment. As AJ said, the movie, the book, the work. And I say to our folks, that's the marathon. 26.2 miles is a marathon. We're not doing any sprints. Most African-Americans, I tease them, I say most African-Americans love the sprints. 100 yard dash, 50 yard dash, it's over. No, we're talking marathon, 26.2 miles, the long game <laughs> to make that change. So okay, Carol, yeah. thank you, because I, I can run it's on. all right. I appreciate no, we need, you, brother. We need to hear that. We need to hear I that. Appreciate and that. also, we're going to go over a few minutes, because I want everybody to participate uh, in this forum. Uh, is Maggie Is Maggie out there, Maggie Linton? No, she's not on. Okay. What What about, um, who, do, who else is out there that I can't see? We got Lawrence Lucas. And do we have Dr. Uh, Julie? Uh, uh, she, she's not there, too? No, she's not there, either. Okay, bring uh, Lawrence Lucas on for a couple of minutes. Lawrence, come on on. Got to unmute. Unmute. There you go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that I have not uh, uh, been here in a number of weeks, but I think um, today was a very opportune time for me uh, to join. I listened to what... Uh, Ali and Nate has been saying, and I do believe that 
what you all are doing and the idea that things have to be done and the idea that everything and we leave the responsibility for those at the top. Uh, I agree with uh, your philosophy and carrying forth your program. I'd love to see that uh, walking while black uh, tape, but you're right. It has to come from the bottom up. Uh, you're talking about, and I deal with it all the time, you're talking about changing a culture and, a, and we're talking about changing a culture that understands dignity and respect of those that they are supposed to serve. So I want to just congratulate you two gentlemen and, and your organization for doing what you're doing. Keep on doing it. Uh, if there's any way that um, I can get involved or help in any way, and I think Harold can help me with that, or I make a direct contact with uh, AG, AJ or uh, Nate So on that. So thank you for educating me and uh, I'm gonna do whatever I can to support you. Thank you. I wanna come back uh, to my man, uh, uh, Dwayne Bryan. Dwayne, I know you wanna come in now. This is a good time for you to come in and, and let me know how much you have picked up uh, from this uh, walking uh, while black, love is the answer. Dwayne? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I, I definitely love the work that Brother AJ is doing. I was actually just typing him in the inbox. Um, and clearly, you know, how do you judge a tree by the fruit that it bears? Clearly, he's bearing good fruit, which means that the tree has to be powerful, has to be positive and productive. Um, I was just going to put in the chat because I got to get ready to go down to Miami. Um, I was going to share with AJ uh, something we just released. It's called The New Conversation. Also, I wrote the book, um, The Stop Improving Police and Community Relations. Chicago Public Schools have accepted it, Broward County Public Schools, Palm Beach County, and a few other school districts, et cetera, the book and the workbook. Um, the New Conversation is an online series, and it really talks about 400 years of, uh, from police patrols, militia, 13th Amendment, and really brings us right up to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, et cetera. Um, it talks about a lot of different solutions. Uh, I am an alumni of the FBI Citizens Academy, so I didn't want to be someone who just wanted to argue with the police and be angry, but I wanted to understand what they do, how they do. I've done uh, town hall meetings with Chicago Police Department. In Pennsylvania, I received a proclamation from the uh, Pennsylvania Black State Legislators on the book and the work with the stop. So if there's, I don't know if there's potential collaboration, it sounds like that we both are kind of doing our thing. But if there is, um, I'll put my information in the chat. Um, but I love the work that you're doing. Love the film idea because you can have all the books in the world. The reality is people want to see the movie. If it moves them, then they'll go read the book. Because someone said, D, hey, your book is great, but black people ain't going to read your book. And I was like, what? And so the fact that you did a movie, congratulations, that's a big up. Um, because I think that's when people start seeing it and feeling it and feeling the emotion and listening to the testimonies. It looks like you have a lot of law enforcement in there as well. And police listen to police. They don't always listen to the person who's shouting on the side of the street, who's angry, the mother, my child never did anything, because they can almost rehearse that line verbatim what she's going to say. Um, so congratulations with the work that you're doing. If there is a way to collaborate, our stuff now is online. Um, we're now starting to engage in corporate America as well. Um, for Brother Nate, uh, we got a call actually. What's interesting is there are a lot of companies now where the black and the white employees is just like riffs. And it's a lot of division. We had a call from a $3 billion financial organization where they were doing a workshop and a white lady was saying, hey, when you're stressed, I just get a football and I squeeze it real hard and I throw it up in the air and all of my stress is gone. And the black employees were like, I cannot believe this white woman's on here talking this foolishness. And then all of the other people just started chiming in and the CEO realized we haven't discussed George Floyd. We haven't discussed Breonna Taylor. Right. Why are we assuming that our black employees, since it wasn't them and their family, they're going to even care about it because they did not know the collective consciousness that we still have this day amongst our people. Um, so even in the corporate world, uh, they're moving into that uh, space of how does this social justice impact what we do right here in this office and how can we make this a difference? So if there's uh, additional collaborations or even sharing what we're doing. I'm totally open to do that, uh, but good luck with what you're doing. 
having a brother like Nate Austin clearly is an absolutely uh, Walter Payton running back who's breaking through those holes and doing what he can do. Congratulations on what you guys are doing. It's great to see black men working together for our young people to ensure that they don't have to be afraid the way we've been all of our lives. Dwayne, okay. if I can add a Dwayne. little bit to what you're doing on Hold that. Up. Uh, let me say this because uh, I wanted to give everybody a chance to uh, chime in and it did. I, want, I just want to say thank uh, you know, to Dwayne for coming on. I know you got to run. But I just, I just want to say, man, what is, what, this, what is happening? My work in community policing is history. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's easy to find. Uh, go all the way back with Patrick Murphy, the godfather of police community in New York, and came to Washington, D.C. as the chief, as the police department chief, and ran uh, the fire department at the same time in 1967-68. So when you start talking about uh, community policing, I, I've done it. I've been there. Nobody has, in this area has had more police community relations formed than I've had. I've been out there in the street. I had two brothers uh, who came through law enforcement, one with the D.C. Police Department, the other U.S. Marshals. What I'm seeing that, uh, now, Nate, and AJ and Gary, and Gary, as you well know, and as Jackie well knows, that we got a, a problem right here in PG County uh, Police Department where they get ready to hire a brand new chief, man. Do you realize how important that is? This is going to be the most uh, important, uh, uh, um, you know, hire in, 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 in also Brooks's career because you got to start at the top, yeah, we got to start from the bottom just like we are at the bottom, okay? But bringing in a new chief at this juncture with everything that's going on around us, man, we got, there's got to be a checks and balances, man. There's got to be a checks and balances. And, you know, I'm very close to some people that know what's going on, but we got to be transparent. You can't tell me that you hide a, 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 a search committee from somewhere else, and we don't know who they are. That's important. That's that should be transparency. We should know who are the people that are hiring. You are hiring to bring a, a new chief into PG County, which has been one of the most brutal and racist departments in the country. You hear what I'm saying? They have always ranked in the top ten, always. And now we got a uh, 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 imposition where we can watch what's happening. And I think, man, with, with this show, it shows the importance of people like AJ, Nat, who's been there, Dwayne, Gary, who's, whose mother was uh, on the police department, you know? So we, we got a lot of things going on here, man. And people, we got to have a checks and balance system. That's what I'm saying. We got to have a checks and balance system. And right now, this is the most important time to do that because if you watch yesterday, all those good old boys that that uh, President Trump said was in Charlottesville, well, they went Washington D.C. yesterday. They went Washington D.C. and you know what they did last night? That same violence came out last night. So where, are, where where's the check and balance system? Here, Trump rides right through the protesters on the way to the golf course. Hmm. That's the type of leadership, man. That we got to we got to get rid of. He got to go. And anybody else, those spooks who are sitting behind the door, keeping other people out, blocking us from making changes, man. We got to call them out. Okay, Nate, go ahead, baby. No, I was just I agree with you 110 percent, and I'll get into that. But this is back to Dwayne uh, real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, our national organization, and I'm open for further discussions with you. What we've seen the same way we represent. Uh, as I said, a large HR group. We've seen companies on the corporate side because I left corporate America as a VP of HR. So I understand what you're saying because we've been bombarded with companies all over the country asking for us as resources and all because we've got senior people, myself coming with the C-suite. Very quickly, what we've said to those companies coming in in the same way that I said with AJ, what's your long game? Mm -hmm. And when we look at these companies, and some of them are, I can tell you right now, are what we call our Fortune 500, Fortune 50 companies. First thing that I always do is look at, go on their line and look at who's on their board of directors. And when I look at their board of directors and many of those companies, their board of directors are all white males. And I've told 
the senior vice president for several companies that we've had dialogue with, look, if you want us to come on board, first thing you got to do is start looking at changing the hue of your board of directors. And that means you've got to not have one, but we want at least two or three on there. So you want us to do unconscious bias training. We call it box checking. That's checking a box and you're moving on. So again, what we're saying to these corporations that are approaching us, they, we have signed five and 10 year agreements and telling them, here's what we're going to do and here's what we're gonna be the resource for. And that resource is gonna be helping you to solicit and identify people on your board of directors. Start recruiting at HBCUs because you basically think that, hey, you can't go out here and find anybody like Wells Fargo said, no, we don't buy that guy. We don't buy that at all. There's at, at over 110 HBCUs and I wanna know how many are you recruiting from? Also, if you got a, what we call employee affinity groups or employee resource groups, we're involved in all of that. So uh, I welcome the dialogue with you, giving you uh, at the chance to maybe discuss that with you further. So please do that. On the flip side, back side of that, Harold, I agree with you in terms of the search for that Prince George's County Police Chief. I would say to anybody, what you end up doing as a person of color, get involved. Don't sit on the sidelines. Put pressure on also Brooks, put pressure on the county council. You vote, we pay taxes and all. You should have, and, it's, and really as far as full disclosure, the county under the open meetings law and all should basically be transparent in determining who that search committee is, what's the criteria for that chief, whether they're going, in the case of Howard County, what the chief did here was promote a human resources person who just retired and promoted her into or nominated her with county council approval as police chief. But she was homegrown and she's in, she was involved in Howard County. So you need to ask those questions. One, who's the search group? Two, what's the criteria for the selection process of the police chief? And then if it's going to be the County Executive also Brooks, Angela also Brooks making the selection is, I assume is going to be approved by the County Council. So whatever that approval process is, anybody that's on this call that's involved in Prince George's County needs to start asking those questions and holding that County Council person, whether it's Barnes or whomever, I know Delegate Barnes over there, but if whoever that county council person is in your district, hold his or her feet to the fire and asking those questions, because you're absolutely right. This is a critical time for the selection of any police chief going forward, because trust me, I spent three years with Prince George's County. Yeah, times have changed, but the culture and the history of that police department has not changed that much. And you've got to have a police chief in there. And really, to be quite candid, in Prince George's County, the, the organization that has the most power in the police department is the FOP. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the power broker there, is the FOP. And that FOP consists of all the rank and file and those majors, captains, lieutenants, mm -hmm. and sergeants. Those are the first people there. So. I would even say to you, let's even go a little bit further, dive deep. What's the representation in that FOP of people of color in there? Because back then, if we show this movie, Walking Wild Black, like AJ said, turn Luther Johnson around, you gotta have some of those black police officers see this film to understand that guess what? Law enforcement is a choice. I chose to join the state police. I chose to join Prince George's County. I chose and was selected to be chief of police, but I didn't choose my color, mm -hmm. okay? I did not choose my color and I can't change that color, but I can change and put on a different uniform or take it off and now sub be subject to the same exact walking wild black, who cares? And there's a police, there's a, uh, customs agent in Alabama that got stopped by law enforcement, a local sheriff, and she was in uniform. 
That's right. Everybody knows that she was in uniform and I am in the process of reaching out to her. She was in uniform, border patrol with a badge and she got stopped. So this is what we're saying now that we've got to change this movement and every chance I get, that's why I'm AJ's wingman to say wherever he goes, you call me and I'm there. So I will tell you point blank, I understand it from a human resources standpoint. I understand it from a cultural standpoint. I understand it from a law enforcement standpoint. We've got to change. And this is why it's a movement, not a moment. That chief there, if he or she is there for five or 10 years, they're going to start making a difference in the changing of that culture. Man, I gotta go. I'm excited. I want to stay longer. I think I'm gonna just put it on my Zoom on my phone when okay. I get in the car because I know y'all gonna be here for a while. Nate, no, we're gonna get, 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 get out of here. We're gonna get out. This is what I want to do. AJ, you go ahead. The last last word. I want everybody to take a minute. Starting with uh, let's start with uh, Lawrence Luther. I want you to take a minute, Lawrence, one minute, so we can get out of here. And let everybody then AJ uh have the last word. Lawrence Lucas, go ahead. Are you there, Lars? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay, I want to congratulate, I want to congratulate all of you all on the call today, uh, taking the time. Uh, but um, I have been enlightened. I've uh, been knowledgeable of what can be done. But it's always, always good to see people at the ground level, at the grassroots level, uh, pushing up and pushing out to bring about change. So I'd like to congratulate all of you that are in this struggle. And uh, you have to always remember, you're not alone. Thank you. All right. Uh, CJ. Uh, yeah, uh, I just want to, you know, thank everyone on behalf of the work that they're done on that they're doing on on behalf of police reform and on changing the system in a substantive way, as was alluded to before, like, um, mm. I know the millennial and Gen Z generation, there's a there's a lot of lip service paid, but there's especially the Gen Zers, they're, they're paying attention to more than just lip service now, instead of, there's been lip service paid for a long time, but we really appreciate and notice when action and substantive policy comes from, you know, said lip service. So that's what really counts and that's what is appreciated. And that is what's gonna, I believe, bring that collaboration and that trust from both sides, as was talked about before, to restore that bond between the community and, and the police. Okay, Jackie. Yes, I just want to thank everybody for uh, coming today and, and for such an informative discussion. And I look forward to the point where we're talking uh, as the movement grows about what happens on the community side of the ledger. We know what work has to be done with the police, but I'll be real interested in how we talk to our children, how we talk to our grandchildren, how we talk to schools and, and teachers and other folks who have influence on how our children are seen, how they're viewed, how they're treated, and, and that all informs the way they're treated by police as well. So I'm looking forward to furthering the discussion. All right. Dwayne, you still there? Man, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we go. I just want to say, Brother AJ, Brother Nat, is it Nat or Nate? Like Nat, Nat King Cole. Okay. Nat King Cole and, and, and Nat Turner. I got you. You got it. <laughs> yep, yep, Brother Bill, Brother Johnson, and Brother Johnson, and Miss Jones. It's uh, great to be here. I'm so glad to see a different level of the work. I know I've been out here in the trenches, the groundwork, but then to see the level of strategic partnerships, that's on a whole different level. And I want to say to Brother CJ, I hear your heart. And when I listen to the millennials, when I'm in schools, they're saying the same thing you're saying. They're saying, yo, your generation didn't do it. So now we're going to get it done in our generation. And I understand that power and that pain and that passion as well. But I'm going to let you know that it seems like with Brother AJ, Brother Nate, myself, we are putting our life on the line because the reality is if we don't do this now, then you guys are gonna have the same conversation that we didn't have, that our grandparents didn't had. Right. And it's honestly, it's unfortunate and it's unfair. Right. So it looks like there's a structure in place to be able to help do that, the hard lifting. When we're talking about policies, 
that is absolutely where we need to be, but also that fraternal order of police. And AJ and Brother Nate, check out COPA, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability. I'm a community advisor member in the city of Chicago. It's the largest, most effective police accountability um, organization in the nation. We get 1% of all of Chicago Police Department's budget comes to COPA. And those some strategies there as we're talking about how to uh, reform and things of that nature around the world. It's a lot for us to be able to talk about. And so I know that's a minute, so I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna call you brothers. Thank you, Harold Bell, for okay. telling me I'm gonna get on this call today. My man, my man, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, where's Gary, Gary? I'm right here. When you get me, you get CJ. When you get CJ, you get me. So it's a two for one value pack. <laughs> We're gonna use this platform and all of the social media platforms that I have. And I know everyone on this panel has influence collectively. We are making a difference and we'll continue to do so. Okay. All right, AJ Ali, you got it. Close it out. Well, man, thank you so much for, for having me on, for having Nat on uh, with me. You know, I, I want to make a commitment to you, CJ, um, that, you know, I made a commitment early on that I was going to do, this was going to be a 30-year plan. And I want to make a commitment to you that any resources that we can bring to the table to help you do this kind of work, you got it. I know that some of us older folks have, have let down some of the younger generation, but I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to make this my thing. I'm here to empower young people like yourself. And so anything that I can do, I'm, I'm here to be able, to, re, to, to, be able to, to get resources to you and people of your age. So one of the things that we have committed to in our Love is the Answer work, the movement, is to form mentoring circles around people, young people in particular, and, and, and returning citizens, and, and to give them the resources they need to not only be their best, but to change this country into what it should be, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So my commitment is, is if you ever call me, and please do, and you have an ask, I'm gonna do my very best to, to try to help make that happen. And Gary, hold me accountable, brother. Because, I got you. Yeah, cause you know, that's what it, you know, talk means nothing without action. That's right. That's so, right. you know, in, in, in closing, you know, I just want y'all to do the pledge with me. That's it, it'll only take a minute. I, just repeat after me if you believe in it. If you believe in the power of love, I, I pledge to learn about the people in my community. I pledge to I learn pledge about to learn the people, people in my community. community. To unconditionally open my heart. To unconditionally open my heart. To their needs as if they were all immediate family members. To their needs as if they were all immediate family members. To volunteer to be part of the solution. To volunteer, volunteer to be, be a part, part of, of the solution. solution in their life, in their, in life, life, their life, during both good and challenging times, during both, during both good, good and challenging, and challenging times. times, and to empower everyone I meet, and to, and to empower, empower everyone, everyone I meet, to do the same, to do, do the same, same, as if our lives depended on each other. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Hey, look here, gang. I amen. want to thank everybody. Thank uh, you, Harold. This is very all my Gary, man. Thank man. you, CJ. I thank just you. want to you say good meeting you, brother. Absolutely. Look, I, would, I just want to say I want everybody to remember, and especially we got a young man like CJ on, that we got to keep our word. See, too many times we just give our word and don't follow through. And what black men and women got to understand in America is that the only thing we own is our word. They can take our car, our income, our home, and everything else. But we got to keep our word to our young people. They're I watching agree. us. They're watching us. So, man, until next Sunday, I want you to remember that every black face you see is not your brother, and every white face is not your enemy. I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone.
All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. This concludes uh, our show. Good night, everybody. Good Be night. Safe. Good night. Good night.